Deuteronomy chapter 21. An interesting chapter. If one be slain, if one be found slain in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it, okay, in the land of Israel, there is somebody who's been slain, killed, lying in the field, and it be not known who has slain him. Now let's run this to the Lord Jesus Christ. Besides the name Aeneas and Caiaphas, who were the people that said crucify him? Crucify him. His brother. Well, it's the brother, but what are their names? Who are they? No they can charge. We don't know. And Jesus Christ was slain. We got two names. We got the Roman government. Who were the ones that beat him? Who were the ones that put those nails in in his in his uh, hands and his feet? So the question, and that's been a question, you know, is it the Romans? Is it the Jewish people? The book of Acts gives you the answer. Peter says it was the Jews. But what? who individually? Then thy elders and thy judges shall come forth. These are the people of the land, the people. These are the rulers. And they shall measure unto the cities which are round about him that is slain. And it shall be that the city which is next unto the slain man, even the elders of that city shall take an heifer. All right, let's stop right there. Jesus Christ did not die in Jerusalem. He died outside the gates of Jerusalem. And if you were to measure the land and find out what is that closest city, it would be Jerusalem. And now they're to take a heifer. Which has not been wrought with. It has not had uh, been farmed. It has not been put to the yoke. It has not uh, plowed the earth. It's a young cow. It's never been worked. It hasn't carried people around. It doesn't have a wagon attached to it. it. Never has. It has not. That has not been wrought with, and with. And which has not drawn in the yoke. And the elders of that city shall bring down the heifer unto a rough valley. Which is neither eared nor sown. No one's ever planted anything in this. It is a ground that has been untouched by man. It is a pure valley. Not polluted by man's hands or tools. God said, well, if you're going to build me an altar, do not use hewed stone. If you touch it with iron, you polluted it. So the best state that man has never touched is pure. The snow on a mountain is pure. A river that flows from that snow is pure. And yet Genesis 3 it is bound in the curse because of man, because of his rebellion against God and the word of God, which is neither eared nor sown, and shall strike off the heifer's neck there in the valley. So, and this is likened to that red heifer. When they go out to battle and they touch a dead body, the cleansing of that red heifer, the water of cleansing. And the priests, the sons of Levi, shall come near. So, you got to have the elders. You got to have the priests and recognize who they are. The sons of Levi. That's unknown today. Shall come near for them the Lord thy God has chosen to minister unto him. And to bless in the name of the Lord. And by their word shall every controversy and every stroke be tried. They're the judges in the land. They're the ones, if you have, a, you have a matter against somebody, you would go to the gates, you go to the elders and to the priests. And all the elders of that city that are next unto the slain man shall wash their hands over the heifer, which is beheaded in the valley. Now that beheaded is the first time that beheaded shows up in the Bible. 
And it has to do with his heifer that is slain because someone else is slain and we don't know who it was that did the slaying. It's a young cow. Well, Christ died pretty young. 33 and a half years old, that's young. But do you see something else in this passage that reminds you something of Jesus Christ and his trial? Let's go to Matthew 27, 24. Matthew 27, 24. Matthew 27, 24. Jesus is standing trial. When Pilate saw that he could prevail, nothing. They want him crucified. They want him dead. But that rather a tumult was made. They're fighting. They are urging the crowds to, to crucify him. They are antagonizing the crowd. Crucify him. They want Jesus dead. He took water. Now it's funny because the, the other time we read about that red heifer, water was separation. And washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood this of this just person. I just declared Jesus Christ innocent without fault again. See ye to it. And then stupidly they say, they answer the people, say, his blood be on us and on our children. So guess who slays him? Yes, I know Jesus Christ suffered and died and gave up the ghost. And he, no one can kill God, but God himself laid down his life. But look at the charge. And what you're forgetting is the fact is that I want you to go to Ahab and I want you to tell him, why did you murder Naboth? And Ahab could say to Elijah, well, I didn't kill him. My wife did. Yeah, but you're in charge. Joab and his brother were charged, though with a murder of a man. And yet it says Joab's brother was also charged with the murder. You don't have to do a crime. You just got to think it according to the Bible. And when you realize when you preach what you think, you're hold accountable what you think. Whosoever looking upon a woman to lust after her in his heart. He didn't sleep with her. He didn't jump in bed with her. He just thought about it. And the charge of adultery is there. So when we come back to Numbers 21, here is somebody who's been slain. We don't know who did it. It's to a particular city, which if it's Jesus Christ, a type of, it would be Jerusalem. And here we have Ananias and Cleopas. The priests are egging the people on to, to kill this man. For no reason. And right in the middle of that, we read about a Roman governor. And in verse 6 again, all the elders of the city that are next unto the slain man, all the elders are right there. They're egging the people to crucify Jesus. That are next unto the slain man shall wash their hands over the heifer that is beheaded in the valley. Pilate says, I wash my hands on this man. That guy is innocent. That guy is just. And then he still has Jesus crucified. It's supposed to be the Jewish government that washes their hand over that heifer. Now some proclaim that this has got to happen before God gets right. They've got to look at the fact is that Jesus Christ died. The Son of God, the Messiah. Somebody did it. It's our fathers and we got to break out this heifer. you got to find out who the Levites are. And they shall answer and say, Our hands have not shed this blood. Well, literally, no, they didn't. By actions, neither have our eyes seen it, which definitely, yes. The future Jews who say, Hey, we didn't see it. We're just going by the stories of this Bible. You know, the New Testament, which has not been believed by our fathers, and according to the New Testament, it, it, Peter says in Acts, it's us. And if we slain Jesus Christ, the Messiah, according to the book of Acts, according to the preaching of Peter, the apostle to the Jewish people, how are we going to get right with God? Here's chapter 21. 
They shall answer and say, Our hands have not shed this blood, neither have our eyes seen it. Let his blood be upon us and our children. Be merciful, O Lord, unto thy people Israel, which thou hast redeemed. And lay not innocent blood unto thy people of Israel's charge, and the blood shall be forgiven them. Let his blood be. That blood is still charged to their children. They have not gotten that statement right to God yet. Except an individual Jew that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as a Savior. You say that's impossible. Is not the sins of, Abraham, of Adam and Eve still passed on to the generations today the curse? So shalt thou put away the guilt of innocent blood. Well, that's Jesus. That's, that's Jesus right there. Innocent, precious, spotless, the innocent blood. Judas said, from among you, when you shall do that which is right in the sight of the Lord. Okay, paragraph. When thou goest forth to war against thy enemies, Wait a minute, we just left chapter 20 about war. Chapter 20 verses 1 to 20 is about war. 21 verses 1 to 9 is about this slain man. Now in verse, verse 10, we go back to war. <laughs> in the middle of war, we're talking about a slain man in the land. When thou goest forth to war against thy enemies, and the Lord thy God has delivered them into thy hands. See, God's in charge. And thou hast taken them captive. Now these would be enemies that are outside, not in the land of Canaan. Because the land of Canaan, you're supposed to destroy them all. You're not to have the Amorites, the Hittites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and Jebusites. You're not supposed to have them live. They do, but they, they're not supposed to. So, and seeth among the captives a beautiful woman, and has desire unto her, that thou wouldest have her to be thy wife. Well, look at that. God has set a regulation that a non-Jewish woman. The God that said, hey, you can marry within your tribes, but if you see this woman, then thou shalt bring her home to thy house, and shalt shave her head. Purification. Paul tells us that the woman's hair is a glory and a crown to her. Erase all that hair. Take off all the fact of who she is. She's got to humble herself to walk around with no hair. And I'm sorry what God has done to the American woman and the women of this world today. One of the things is, is a drug for, for cancer will make you lose your hair. But we'll give you a wig and we'll give you hats and stuff like that. And America just wipes it clean. They don't get right with God. Even with cancer. Many don't. And pear, which means cut her nails. Now, I'm going to leave it as a question mark. Maybe she's got painted nails. and uh, It's just weird how he says you've got to cut her nails. She shall put the raiment of her captivity from off her. Right? Take off. The, they had certain garments back then that identified who you were. Judah looks at a woman and says, oh, she's a harlot by her clothes. And then when she's done playing the harlot, she takes off those clothes and puts on the, the widow clothes. Widowhood. Hollywood does that. They put different clothes on to, to proclaim who they are. Youth groups puts different clothes on to pretend who they are. This woman, there's a clothes for captivity. And it's an interesting study in the Bible about certain clothes. And shall remain in thy house. I mean, I don't know if she's not to go outside. It just says remain in thy house. Well, the house in, it could be the yard. And bewail her father and mother a full month. 30 days. Let her pass the memories of her mom and dad, her parents. 
They're heathen. She's going to join this guy. She's not going to be allowed to step out of Israel no longer. And they may even be dead. And after that, thou shalt go in unto her marriage and be her husband and she shall be thy wife. Did you get that? The, the, the marriage bed relation joins a man to a woman. Jesus told that woman, well, go get your husband. I ain't got no husband. Yeah, that's right. You got, I think what, seven or eight of them? And the one you have right now is not your husband? Some people don't teach that, but that's what the marriage, but that's what marriage is in the Bible, is that relation between man and woman. And it shall be if thou have no delight in her. For whatever reason, she doesn't delight you as much as you thought. Amen. David's son for Tamar. Oh, he had this great love for her and he rapes her and then I, I don't want her. Then thou shalt let her go within her, with whether she will. All right. She wants to go back to her land. She wants to stay in Israel. She has that option. But thou shalt not sell her at all for money. A divorce. There's a written divorce because you don't like her. But you can't sell her. You can't pass her on to some. You can't do what, what, the, what the brothers of Joseph, Joseph did. Say, here, give us 20 pieces of silver. You can't pass this woman off on the caravans or, or somebody else and say, hey, this is how much she's worth. Give me money. You can't do that. Her, uh, where, go on to her and she'll be able, and shall be if thou have no delight in her then thou shalt let her go whether she will but thou shalt not sell her at all for money thou shalt not make merchandise of her because thou hast humbled her okay you can let her go you don't like her let her go but don't sell her and don't put her up on the shelf don't put her on the table with a price tag hanging off her that's not right she has, look what it says. It says, whether she will. All right, you want to divorce her. She has whatever she wants to do at that point. You say, you don't love me no more. You don't want me to be your wife. Okay, I can go where I can go now. You have no more control over me. I'm set free from you. That's what a divorce is. If a man have two wives, paragraph mark. So we're going for war. Now we're going, if a man have two wives. So we're in the bounds of marriage here now as, as set forth by God. If a man had two wives, if a man has two wives. It doesn't say God thanks you. You can't find anywhere in the Bible where God says, I approve of two wives, three wives, four wives, 500 wives, 1,000 wives. You never find one place where God said, hey, that's good, go for it. You're going to find the fact is when you get the polygamous relationships that are in the Bible, they cause problems. Nothing but problems. One beloved. I'm trying to think. Rachel and Leah. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. No, that's begotten. But beloved. That's the first time that word shows up there. And it's talking about a man with two wives. That's a weird spot. That's a weird spot for beheaded. Oh, you're my beloved. <laughs> and if you run that back to the first time. The, the thing is. The Bible, the first time it shows up in the Bible, it sets a record forward. And here's a man that has two wives, and if one beloved, what's that mean? Like my wife said, there's Rachel and there's Leah. Oh, Rachel is adored and great and wonderful, and Leah. Mm. And another hated, and they have borne him children, both the beloved and the hated. It, and if the firstborn son be her that was hated, Reuben, then it shall be when he maketh his sons to inherit that which he hath, that he may not make the son of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated, which is indeed the firstborn. Now, where Jacob had done right with this one, Reuben went and slept with Jacob's wife. So, there goes the firstborn. It's been cursed. But it's self-explanatory. 
You can't make, oh, because I love this woman and her, and her children the best and so great. No, 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 no. If that firstborn son is of that woman that's hated, he's the firstborn son. You can't do nothing about that. But he shall acknowledge, first place that shows up, acknowledge. Acknowledge shows up, all right, you got two women loved and hated, and you got sons by them, and the son that is hated, you got to acknowledge him. He's the firstborn. They said, I'm only beginning these the beginning words of the Bible. I'm up to D right now. But it's an interesting study. If you go through your Bible with a concordance, you can find one online. That's what I got. And you find it quite interesting. Mark where those words show up. Acknowledge the sons of the hated for the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he had. For he is the beginning of, the, of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. And implying that God, God gave you that first son. And God gave you that first son by that woman. And then again, you run back to Jacob with Leah and Rachel. Look how long that God held Rachel's womb from bearing any children. If a man have a start, okay, paragraph. We've gone from finding a woman, we've got a woman, now we're looking at the children. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastised, chastised okay. chastened, chastened, excuse me, that's the first time chastened shows up in the Bible. Like I said, I'm only up to see. And where does it show up in this context? A child that will not obey. America's going against Deuteronomy 21 verse 18. Let's read on. Will not hearken unto them. Then shall his father and mother, his mother, both of them, what we read about witnessing, you can't have one witness. can't be just the father. And it can't be just the mother. But out of the mouth of two or three, now here comes the two or three witnesses. They grab this kid by the, by the ruffle of his neck and say, come on. Probably take both of them to bring him down. Lay hold on him. <laughs> Man, this is by force. And bring him unto the elders of the city unto the gate of his place, your city where they live. It's the parents' responsibility. That city gate is where all this all the business taking place. All the documentation, all the, the, the legal transactions, all the courts, all everything that has to do with, with that city's business. There it is. And they shall say unto the elders of his city, This our son, there he is, is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He's a glutton. Anything to the excess is not just eating. And a drunkard. Now let's look at Matthew eleven nineteen. Matthew eleven nineteen. You say, where are we going with this one? 11.19, Matthew. This is in the Bible interesting. 11.19, and we'll start in verse 16. But whereunto shall I liken this generation? It's like unto children sit in the market stores. You've seen the pictures. And calling unto their fellows and say, We have piped unto you. We played music, and you have not danced. We have mourned unto you. And you have not lamented. For John came neither eating nor drinking. And they say, he has a devil. He's a clean living guy. He has a devil. Mm. The son of man, Jesus, came eating and drinking. And they say, behold, a man gluttonous and a wine bibber. A friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of virtue. You know what they're trying to do to Jesus? They're trying to kill him. Well, here's our son. He's stubborn and gluttony. 
And we'll see Luke 7.34. Luke 7.34. The only problem is, I don't know what happened to Joseph, but for a father and mother was supposed to bring their child. I know Joseph is not Jesus' father. What's the nation trying to do it? And we'll talk about that in a minute, but uh, Luke 7.34. I'll show you something. It's been off pre in a minute, but after this. 7.34, Luke. The Son of Man is come eating and drinking. And ye say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a wind... That's twice. Wine bibbler. That's twice. That's two times, two witnesses have recorded what they said about Jesus. I don't think that's, I don't think Jesus ever did anything excess. But here's the people speaking about it. And when it came to this rebellious child, if they're trying to use it to, to get Jesus, the father and the mother is to bring the child. Well, Mary's not there. But when you see chapter 21, verses 1, Tonight, here's the group of Israel bringing forth the heifer for the slain man. Here's a group of Israel trying to bring forth Jesus Christ to kill him. Oh, he's a gluttony and he's a drunkard. You mean Joseph wasn't there? What's that? You said Mary wasn't there. You meant Joseph wasn't there? Well, either either or. Like I said, Joseph, we don't know. He falls out of the scene. Mary was there. But Mary, didn't, Mary did not bring him forth to the elders. Yeah. If that charge, if that's what they're trying to do with that charge, it's supposed to be the mother and father bringing him. And you don't wait till he's 30, 31, 32 years old. And there's no age prescribed, but as soon as that child will not listen, will not adhere to the parents. What age is that? I don't know. Verse 21, And all the men of the city shall stone him with stones that he die. Death row. It's kind of harsh. But he's not going to pack heat and walk into the school with a gun and start shooting everybody, is he? Not if he's dead. You got to get back in the Bible. Those people who have killed much in America, if they're not dead right now, they are sitting in a room that's air conditioned, that's eating with clothes and a meal. I don't care if it's just a bologna sandwich. It's still a meal. With a bed. It's not what the Bible says. Capital punishment. Shall stone him with stones. You know how many times they took up stones to cast at Jesus and kill him? Many times. That he died. So shalt thou put evil away from among you. And what does capital punishment do? And all Israel shall hear and fear. Did you hear what they did to little Judah? That boy was acting. Yeah, I know how bad that boy. What did they do? They finally took him down to the city and they stoned him. Little Joab, did you hear what they did to little Judah? That's what's going to happen to you if you don't get right. Little Sarah, you better behave yourself because if you don't, you hear what they did to little Judah? And that would be talked around the school, in the synagogues, in the city, and at the water. Well, that would bring fear. What's the fear today? Oh, John went to jail. Really? Yeah, well, how bad is jail? Oh, I've been there. How bad is it? Oh, I get a room. I get food. I get I get to, with gang members. I, I, I get all kinds of fun. I, TV. And TV. I can get sex. I can get drugs. I can, uh, let me go on. What fear is there of jail today? Matter of fact, you know, there are many people who come out of jail, go do something so they can get back in jail. Mm -hmm. You call it a correction system, and it's not correcting. I've been 10 years in the jail ministry. I have left the jail ministry because it's too worldly. And it's not working. 
And the people involved in the jail ministry, those that are in charge are worldly, are, are wicked themselves, and, and non-King James Bible believers. And some of them I've dealt with don't even go to church anywhere. And you can't preach good messages. You can't preach proper messages. And you get them upset. I got kicked out after being in one jail for two weeks because the message I preach on what Bible you're supposed to have when you get out of here, because it's a jail, you know, you weren't there for years and years. You were there for months. When you get out of here, what church to go into? Mine, the fact is, I told you not to go to the Catholic church and not go to this church, but find a Bible-believing church and get your life right and do not go back to the people that you came from. Lord forbid, what did I say wrong that a guy that did not go to church, a guy that did not reverence God, came to me and said, you're not welcome here no more. So pretty much you're telling the people, don't fear God. If a man have committed a sin, paragraph, another paragraph. If a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be, to, if he be, if he be to be, that's hard. If he be to be put to death, thou shalt hang him on a tree. Then we start this chapter with, with a slain man that no one knew who was slain. Now we're going to end it with Jesus dying on the cross. Look at that. His body shall not remain all night upon the tree. Why did they take the body of Jesus down? Deuteronomy 21, 23. But thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. Why did they put him in that tomb? For he that is hanged is accursed. Jesus Christ became a curse that I may have life. That's the first time a curse shows up in the Bible. And it's reference to Jesus Christ. He's accursed of God, that's God's son, that is God who died on that cross, became a curse, went into hell and deposited my sins, and came out of that empty tomb victorious, according to the angels, he's not here, he is risen, he went in, he died of curse on that tree, and came out victorious, that I may have eternal life, that thy land, Israel, knows the land, mark the land, be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for inheritance. Well, isn't that interesting? Let's go to 2 Corinthians 5.21. That's Jesus Christ in the beginning and at the end of that chapter. 2 Corinthians 5.21. See what the church age doc doctrines say about this. First Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5.21. Page folding over. For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made righteousness of God in him. That's what Christ done for us. That is the death of Jesus Christ. He suffered and died. He became sin on that cross, but they didn't know no sin. On that cross, he became sin. You mark that right back to where you say that. Accursed. Without Jesus Christ as my Savior, anybody is unbeliever in the finished work of the gospel of Jesus Christ, they are a curse. They are condemned, John chapter 3. That's what a curse. So let's go to 1 Peter 2.24. 1 Peter 2.24. We're following this man who dies on a, on a tree and they curse. 1 Peter 2.24 You know what's funny? The first church I was in, the preacher got up and he said, Jesus died on the tree. Jesus suffered and died on the tree. I went up to him I said, Pastor, this is, uh, you keep saying tree. He died on a cross. You need to say cross. You know that guy never opened a Bible and showed me why he was saying tree? I was a new Christian. When I grew up in the Catholic Church, it was Jesus Christ died on Good Friday, and Easter Bunny, he showed up out of the tomb, resurrected. And yet, every single day, 365 days in that church, he was still on, nailed on that cross. Now I'm in a Baptist church and he's dying on the tree and I had a question about it and that guy never answered. 
All you have to do is show me these two places. First Peter 2, 24. Who? Christ. His Christ. Own Christ. Self Christ. Bear our sins. Mark that back to 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Isaiah 53. Bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That's, that would answer my question right there. That we being dead to sins should live in righteousness by the whose stripes we are healed. And yet the Bible says over here, accursed. Hanging ought to be the, the, the proper way to, to, to apply capital punishment in America because most of the people in America that die by capital punishment are a curse of God and they're not saved. Unless you believe on Jesus Christ who suffered and died on the cross that you may be saved. Then Christ took your place. The righteousness that we've seen already is the righteousness of God, Jesus Christ. It is no uh, righteousness of mine. I'm a cursed of God before I was saved. April 20th, 1987, I was a curse of God. April 21st up to, I say afternoon, I don't know, I'm going to say 2 o'clock. It's not 2 o'clock. But the afternoon. I was a curse of God. Let's say 2 o'clock. I don't know exactly what time it was. But April 21st, 1987. That moment Christ became my accursed. Deuteronomy 21. I became righteous. 1 Corinthians 12, 3. So we're definitely seeing Jesus in Deuteronomy. 1 Corinthians 12, 3. And like I said, when I had that question to that pastor about on the tree, you know, he could open up a concordance and show me the answer. All right, verse chapter 12, verse 3, Corinthians. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaketh by the Spirit of God, cause Jesus accursed, the Holy Spirit said, whoever dies on the tree is accursed. Calls Jesus accursed and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. To a man that is lost, Jesus, he uses the name of Jesus as, as a what? As a curse. As to somebody who say, what is the name of Jesus? He's the Lord. He's my salvation. He took my sins and bare them on that tree that God says whosoever dies on the tree why wasn't Jesus ever stoned well the Bible says not a bone of him to be broken and you're not a curse if you're stoned but a tree God wrote about that hanging in that tree uh, I'm going to say 14 1480 years like, before Roman ever thought about anything about Crucifixion. In Galatians 3.13. Last place. Galatians 3.13. Now watch this one. Watch Paul apply Deuteronomy 21 right to Jesus Christ if you think I'm foolish. Galatians 3.13. Christ. That's Jesus. There he is, has redeemed us from the curse of the law. And we always read about the testimony of God redeeming Israel. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us, run that back to 21, verse 23. For it is written, okay, Paul, Paul's going to quote somewhere. Curses everyone that hangeth on the tree and that runs us right back to Deuteronomy 21, 23. That is Jesus Christ right there. Paul told us there's no shadow. Be I'm not one of the, whatever Paul says, that's it. Sign, seal, and deliver. I'm not one of those people. But Paul does write to the churches and, and what he wrote to the Galatians. He says, Galatians, everyone turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy 21, 23. That's Jesus. That's Christ. There he is right there. So there's no shadow about to say, if, I'm not sure about 
21, 1 through 9 as being Jesus. I'm not sure. It can be. It may not be. But, oh, when I get to 21, 23, I am definitely sure with Scripture and Scripture. Paul said, God wrote to the Holy Spirit. That is Jesus Christ. There he is. So when I asked that pastor of that church about Christ dying on the tree, wouldn't that have been a great show to show a newborn babe in Christ? Hey, this is for the tree. Man, that would lighten my eyes. But that took my own little study to do. I guess all pastors don't know everything. No matter how much people raise them up. 